All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are back with you for this episode of the Fort Worth Community Arts Center's Boxed Lunch Program. We have a very special guest with us today and a wonderful artist in the Fort Worth area, Terry Thornton. How are you doing today, Terry? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me, Jason. This is fun. Well, we are so glad to have you and uh, so appreciative of you taking the time. So we've moved you around the yard now. We think maybe we might have a good cell signal. If we don't, don't fret, people. It's live. That's what we do. We'll just keep redirecting her until we get through the interview. <laughs> Terry, how you doing today? You know what? Um, I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm doing all right. Good, good, good. So, uh, so far, so good. Uh, again, the uh, ins and outs of the digital world and uh, the interwebs uh, continue to uh, uh, just add to the challenges that are going on in the world these days. So uh, looks like we might have it figured out and uh, we'll just go ahead and get right to it. Terry, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and who and what it is you do. Sure, um, I, um, I am an artist. Um, I am sitting now in uh, the kind of garden area that's adjacent to our studio, which is the funny stripe building over here, over my shoulder. Um, and um, I live in the cultural district. Um, so in a little neighborhood, um, kind of on the edge of a little neighborhood, sort of as it starts going from neighborhood to more urban, that's kind of where we're sitting on the edge of that. Um, I also uh, am curator of education at the Modern Art Museum, uh, which is convenient within walking distance, which is lovely. Um, and also just such a good job, something I'm very proud of, something that um, has positively fed my um, my creative life um, and uh, informed my artwork uh, for the more than 25 years that I've been doing it, um, which is amazing that I've done something, one thing for 25 plus years, but that's what happens when you get older. You just all of a sudden you find yourself 25 years into something. So um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. I, I have a, my husband is Cam Shep. Uh, he is also an artist a sculptor uh, by trade, I guess you'd say, whatever that means. Um, he, um, and we have two children. Uh, Alec is um, our oldest, and she is a lawyer practicing in Portland, Maine. She's um, there with her partner and um, kind of living the life. We're very happy for her. And then August, who is 24, um, a bit of a Peter Pan character, he has... Um, a special condition that has him uh, remaining forever young. So Cam and I tease that uh, in public we've gone from being August's parents to being his grandparents. So <laughs> people often ask us about our grandson and we just like let it ride. Um, Cam and I have uh, most recently um, just um, activated a project that we've been talking about for years and actually has been sitting there just on the verge of being ready to go for three years or more, um, what, called Blind Alley Projects. And it's just a little gallery space. Um, I'm gonna turn here and you can see the roof garden that's up there um, just over this rock pile. Um, is uh, that's And it sits on the other side of our little garden uh, across the street from our home, which is just across there. How smart of me to put my uh, computer on a swivel chair, huh? Uh, and uh, we're really, really happy with the way, the circumstances, uh, of course, of COVID-19 are tragic and awful. Um, uh, I, I guess in the spirit of making the most of a bad situation, um, with the uh, encouragement of some friends who have wanted us to get Blind Alley up and going for a long time, we decided that a drive-by gallery could be just what the moment needed. Yep. And, um, Cam, uh, we, we kind of thought about who, who would be best to sort of launch the space. And Cam teaching sculpture at TCU and having these amazing graduate students, I cannot emphasize that enough, very, very, very talented group of people. Um, and the uh, third 
third year MFAs have been working for three years toward a thesis exhibition, which, uh, like so many other things, COVID-19 uh, brought to uh, an abrupt halt. So um, we decided that if they were willing um, and it and felt like a good fit for them, then we would um, have them present some aspect of uh, their thesis exhibition, something that they were thinking about or working on for the thesis exhibition um, in relationship, and, and then think about it in terms of that space. Um, so that was the way we launched it. It's called Liminal Space, and we're on the last of the four um, exhibitions. And um, in fear that I will mispronounce or forget something, I'm going to send everybody to the website to get the full information on those exhibitions. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a lot. Do we have anything left for the, the rest of the interview or the conversation? Oh, of course we do. We have all kinds of stuff to talk about. Now, that drive-by gallery is over on 4th Street. Is that correct? It, it is. Um, I cannot we live at 3308 and it is across the street from us so i cannot remember it's just it's a lot and sure. i can't remember the, um, the actual number address of the address but again if you go to the website that's also listed there www.blindalleyprojects.com uh, awesome whenever we're done with the interview if you want to hop back onto facebook in the comment sections you can put the website there as well so that people know how to find you and how to get to that. We'll come back to that at the end and make sure that we uh, continue to pitch that and get people over there to see it. I had the uh, uh, privilege of driving by yesterday myself and uh, it really is a really, really neat idea and um, also some really cool stuff in there right now, actually, currently. So uh, uh, hats off to you. That's a great idea and a fabulous way for people to uh, see what's going on in the art world, even in today's situation. So. Art doesn't stop. That's absolutely right. Speaking of art, what have you got on your lunch menu today? Okay, well, I don't know if this would qualify as art, but it is a favorite. Um, I'm going to hold it up. You can see that I got hungry and got started. Uh, it is a tomato sandwich, which is my all time favorite. It's a very seasonal food. The tomatoes have to be ripe and ready. Um, I prefer my uh, tomatoes to taste like sunshine, so they need to be grown outdoors. Um, and uh, the arugula that is on the sandwich came from my garden. I picked it before I came over here, just to be completely picturesque. Um, and then I'm having a pickle, which there's not much left of, that my husband made from some cucumbers. Um, yeah. And then my water with floating cucumbers, which is a favorite, very refreshing, highly recommended. Very nice. Well, I feel like I feel like I might be doing all the work today. So um, I I might have bit off a little more than I can chew today. I'm uh, I'm about to go grocery shopping again. So today I thought I would be bold, and I am making homemade macaroni and cheese with a hot link thrown in there just for a little bit of texture. I've been um, down to about three ingredients for all of my lunches, but today. I've got quite a few, so I'm gonna see if I can actually make this work. So for my ingredients, I've got some macaroni, some butter, flour, and milk, along with some sour cream, some cheese, and of course my hot links. I, uh, I should have done a little bit more research before I just jumped into the fray, because I saw a uh, word that I had to look up called a roux, <laughs> so. No. So I'm going to struggle with that a little bit while I ask you some questions. Right. So if I turn my back around, or if I'm looking at you and you see any flames behind Absolutely. me, if you can just flag me down and I'll turn off the fire and I'll try to get through this. I'm going to be on the lookout for that. <laughs> we're not, we're so, not over your shoulder to be sure fire. I certainly appreciate it because I think I'm actually, I don't know if this qualifies as cooking but for me uh this this <laughs> this might be a challenge it's anytime fun. there's it's cooking <laughs> anytime there's a whisk involved i get a little nervous so <laughs> we'll see how we do here so with that being said um do you mind talking a little bit about um how your organization and yourself as an artist 
um, have been affected by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Sure, sure. So um, I mentioned um, that really the impetus for, for launching Blind Alley were the circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, at the museum, the modern, um, like I said, I'm curator of education, so um, there's really no good reason for programming to stop. It's obviously not the same. Um, art is something you're supposed to see in person. Um, you know, the internet is an amazing place, but it hasn't taken uh, the place of actually encountering a work of art uh, in situ, you know, in relation to your body. Um, that's all important. But um, I work with some amazing people. So um, everybody just jumped in and started uh, doing digital or online uh, programming. We kind of uh, at least initially used what we already do as a model or sort of, it felt, it felt like an honest way to go. So, um, you know, I continued a program that I've been doing for the whole time I've been at the museum, which is called Tuesday Evenings at the Modern. Um, I continued that. Um, and until it had run its season by going back into the archive. Um, it's a lecture series and we had people scheduled to come in, but obviously that was off. We couldn't do that any longer. What, we weren't putting anybody on an airplane so that they could give a lecture in Fort Worth and we weren't bringing anybody into an auditorium given the circumstances. So, um, so we went back into this really deep and rich archive and um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, out, it was very painful to do something that was completely self-induced. I decided to, to give it a personal touch. I would do a little introduction, set up the, uh, the thing each time. And um, I do not have a thespian background like yourself. And uh, it was a big challenge to get in front of the camera and to have my notes so that it didn't look like I was tracking the whole time and to you know, be sure there wasn't anything on my face and to check what I was giving away in the background. That was a whole new world for me. Um, so that was my little thing. Um, I, my colleagues are still going strong with all of their ongoing programs. Um, we're, we're doing a very special online um, summer art camp uh, that my uh, friend and colleague uh, Tiffany Wolf-Smith is working on um, and really is putting in place as we speak. Um, uh, the tours we have continued to, um, my two colleagues, uh, Michael Moore and Amy Cardoso, uh, have diligently, and um, I think it's been purely their pleasure, have stayed in touch with all of our beautiful docents who volunteer their time uh, to, um, you know, keep them engaged and um, to keep learning from each other. And they have staged a few tours with them. And that was, again, everybody's learning curve on being in front of a camera and trying to create a, a, an authentic experience when you're not in the space. Um, and then Jesse Morgan Barnett, um, our, our other colleague who works with uh, students and uh, educators, has had a big job because he's been trying to contribute um, to uh, the situation that the schools find themselves in and, and with some you know meaningful material for to be used and then also um, continuing the programs he does for example the um, teen artist program the tap program um, that has a select a, a group of kids who apply and they're really super serious artists and you know I think what we've tried to keep in mind is that uh, this is more than just the rules of what you need to do to stay safe. This is also the mental and emotional um, impact that it's having on people. Yes. And there, there are some people, some you know, some of our um, our uh, visitors to the museum and and the people that are involved, participants in these programs, that really count on what those programming those programs were offering them. So. Um, we just didn't want to let anybody down. So that's that's been, I think we all agree that we've worked harder at home than we ever worked in the office. Uh, mostly yeah. the learning curve, you know. But um, So yeah, you should be working on your lunch while I'm talking. What oh, are you doing, Jason? I am. I've got my water. <laughs> I'm waiting for my water to boil. I like to take okay. things pieces at a time. And okay. I, I think I could have mentioned this earlier. I don't get so entwined in the conversation, sometimes I forget I'm cooking, so. I, yeah, I can imagine. I'm glad I'm coming in about midway or later on. You have some practice with this. 
That's okay. I got to wait for the water to boil. And uh, you know what they say, a uh, watched pot never boils. Is that right? That's right. That's what I heard. <laughs> so um, I'll talk a little bit about my roux because it looks like you might be a little bit ahead of me on your uh, prep and presentation. Yeah. So um, my roux tells me to take some butter. Uh, it says two tablespoons, but you can't have enough butter. So I just, I just kind of eyeballed that. And so uh, I'm going to throw that in a, uh, another little saucepan and let that melt down. And in addition to that, I was told, <laughs> according to the internet, to uh, put a little bit of flour along with some uh, uh, garlic salt, uh, garlic powder, sorry, for my uh, roux here. And so that will go in once I get all the butter melted. And then um, I've also got some milk and some sour cream. So I have to go through those processes. And then that uh, supposedly creates the uh, cheese sauce that will hopefully go on to the pasta once that is done. So I've got my butter melting here. I've got my uh, flour and uh, seasoning in that. And then I went ahead and put the uh, sour cream in with the milk as well. So I'm just gonna wait for that butter to melt a little bit more. And while I'm doing that, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about uh, what you have learned about yourself as an artist and also your organization uh, during this very trying time. I know you talked a lot about programs, but what have you really found out and learned about people? Well, um, there was, um, well, I, yeah, I think this is all extremely interesting. I, I, I often say that I'm anxious to get 15 years down the road to see what the, you know, what this looked like, um, in hindsight to, to kind of get a better sense of it because it's hard to see it when you're in the middle of it, of course. Right. Uh, but what, I am so interested in uh, human behavior and response um, to this, as well as nature. I don't know if you've noticed, but our our sky is much clearer and crisper, and our grass is greener. And um, I don't think it takes long to see the effects of pollution when everybody stops polluting for a minute. Yeah. Um, but um, in terms of um, how people around me seem to be taking this and how I'm taking it is um, there was a real like can do attitude um, when it came on. Um, but there's a fatigue in that sort of thing, you know, that develops over time. It's, it's, um, I won't say it's not sustainable because we're still doing it. So it's sustainable, but I do think you have, you go through ups and downs. And, and now that I think we're far enough into it to see some of those arcs and dips when we, when we feel positive and we think we can do this and times when we feel like, I don't know if I can do this anymore or, or, you know, we fret, fret over what's our timeline. I mean, human beings are, you know, we, we grow ourselves into order machines. I mean, children, yes. children, uh, you know, are free from that to some extent. Um, but uh, we do have an impact on them pretty early on, unfortunately. But I think when our order, falls apart um, it leaves us a little helpless until we can until we can kind of make sense of it or are determined that it's okay to not make sense of it as somebody right. recently told me um, I have to tell you uh, we go on lots of walks as I think a lot of people do and we've been fortunate to have weather in this part of the world that is allowed for that because I think that's made it a lot a lot more bearable I would not yes. say easy but a lot more bearable but walking through our neighborhood that's just west of us, um, I take my dog on a, a walk every morning, and then we go as a family in the evening. And um, the people that are outside, the kids and the parents who are out in the lawn uh, playing and interacting, um, sometimes too socially close for my comfort, but yeah. you know that's their business. Um, and um, and this is another interesting phenomenon. I want everybody who's watching this to look for it. A lot of the houses up in the area that I'm talking about that's just west of us don't have front porches. They were kind of made in that era where front porches were out 
backyards, you know, people, people sort of shut off from the, from the front of the house. It wasn't that much um, human activity out there. Um, so, but everybody during this time, not everybody, but I'm, I'm just struck by how many front lawns have put up two chairs in the front yard, which seems so beautiful and symbolic of something. Like I said, I'm waiting for some hindsight on this. So I think that's sort of lovely. Um, yeah, it's like people are coupling up and understanding that, you know, they need each other, these two chairs, and that they want to engage with the world outside them because they've been told they can't, you know, and anytime we're told we can't, that creates more desire. And then also what I love is the imagination that has been um, activated uh, and externalized as opposed to it happening on a screen or with a screen. Kids are coming out. There are so many little fairy um, structures. I call them fairy structures because that's what my daughter and my mom and I would have done when she was little. Um, these little structures that kids are coming up with and they're just beyond incredible. They're right. so sophisticated um, and creative and they change. So these kids aren't just making them on the table with their parents and putting them out there. They're actually, it has a life. So I walk by those and occasionally photograph them. And um, yeah, I, the human spirit, it's a marvel. It really is. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I've seen a bunch of uh, yarn bombing, knit bombing. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, uh, official I'm sure I have that. But um, yeah, I've seen a lot of that around and it's really been cool to um, be uh, enhanced to your surroundings. And before this, we really seem to kind of have that tunnel vision of getting to work, getting home. And it's been amazing to me how much our blinders have been taken off to the elements, to the uh, uh, natural aesthetic that is around us. And I I've seen things that I've never noticed for 10 years in the Fort Worth area. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I never even knew that was there. <laughs> and so. I, we definitely had the blinders taken off, I agree. Yeah, yeah, for real. So, all right, so I think my um, roux is coming along here. So I've got the uh, butter and the flour and all of that seasoning in there. But now I'm gonna take uh, two cups of cheese, it says, woo. I'm well, excited about that. Cheese, after all. Yeah. And I'm just gonna drop that in there and let that start melting. My, um, my noodles seem to be coming along pretty well. I cheated and preheated my uh, hot links, so all I gotta do is just drop those in. So now I'm gonna mix that up and we'll see if that actually comes out the way that I think it should. So that you oh, I bet it does. It looks amazing. Let that melt around. And why that is actually happening, I was curious if you wouldn't mind, uh, do you have any secret tips for your sandwich or any secret ingredients to ensure deliciousness? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of simple and um, I am jealous of your mac and cheese, but um, mine has- It's not me yet. <laughs> mine has exactly um, one, two, three, four, five, I guess, ingredients, uh, and then salt and pepper. So you have, I think a sourdough bread is important because it offers that little bite. I always toast it because I think that brings out the flavor and I like the texture. Um, then mayonnaise which I really think all of this is just a vehicle for mayonnaise. That's really the point. And then um, arugula, as I mentioned, and will mention again because I'm very proud, comes straight from our garden right over here. I will actually, can you see maybe? Yes, beautiful. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, I'm so proud of it. Um, and of course it tastes better if you grow it. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then, um, and then the tomatoes, and then I, this is a, shameless plug because if anybody deserves it she does come from our farmer friend uh, Beverly Thomas who has Cold Spring Farms Ooh. and in this very garden um, every Sunday people sign up for her CSA and this is the pickup so they come and pick up 
uh, produce here from Beverly and from the farmers that she works with because she tries to give a good collection of things so that people feel like it you know they have a variety of things they're all seasonal but she within uh, you know a certain radius within Texas a certain radius she'll she'll pick up things so I actually don't know if those tomatoes are directly from her or if they're from further south where there's more you know there's been more heat um, our tomatoes are not ready yet so I don't know what the status is of hers but but they're fantastic and um, yeah, I, I kind of got off track there because I was so proud of all of that. But um, anyway, yeah, so those came from Beverly. Um, I've also accompanied it with uh, a bell pepper, which nice. um, I just eat raw, again, out of the garden. And yeah, those are the ingredients. I, It is nothing like your mac and cheese. Oh, well, like you, you're flattering me way beyond necessity. <laughs> you know that, that you can get mac and cheese in a box? I, you know, I normally eat it out of a box, but I didn't have any, so I thought I'd live a little. It's yeah, the weekend it's coming up. I will thought be I'd come back to the box after this. I'm very well might. So, uh, so my secret ingredient, all of my secret ingredients are are not so secret anymore because I seem to use the same things for everything. But I'm going back with this fabulous sriracha. I just tell you, it works on everything, and so I'll be putting some of that over the top of this. To either add to the flavor or hide the flavor. We'll, we'll <laughs> it works both ways. With oh, yeah. We'll see absolutely how it works out. So I'm not going to lie. I think this is actually turning into something. So my cheese is melting a little bit there. I'm starting to get that uh, uh, texture that I'm looking for. And uh, who knows? I may, I may have to switch professions. So uh, I learned about Rue in the process. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. So while I'm finishing up burning this cheese, um, oh, on a little bit of a sacrifice that for this show. On a little bit of a more serious note, how do you see the uh, arts, or even yourself as an artist? You know, you uh, have that wonderful drive-by gallery. How do you see the arts in general um, adapting? now that um, we're starting to kind of come back out of shelter in place, businesses are, are starting to uh, at minimum consider reopening. How do you see the arts adjusting and changing and what does it look like in the future? Well, um, you know, I think, um, I think the arts is a place where, you know, eyes wide open. So um, I cannot imagine that there aren't lessons being taken from this. Um, and uh, if there's any place we will see those show up, uh, I think it'll be through the arts. Actually, I think it's going to be across our lives. I certainly hope so. I don't think, I think 2020 has so far been a year of reckoning. And it would be a real shame if we didn't um, take advantage of the uh, lessons uh, as well as, you know, we're gonna, if we're going to suffer hardship, then let's at least uh, find the lessons in that. So I think the arts will most certainly um, show that. But the great thing about the arts is you can't anticipate it, right? That's what yeah. the arts are great for. They always surprise us. So we'll see how they things show up. Um, yeah, we'll see. Um, do you see the virtual programs becoming a tool? Um, do you think they're going to fall away? Or do you think people will learn to adjust with those and keep them moving forward? Oh, I think, I think for sure that we're going to understand what the value of those are, um, that they're not just a, res a rescue uh, in a time of need, that they actually have value in and of themselves. Um, and, and I think that we'll probably use them in, um, oh, I, I want to say more authentic ways, but I don't know. Uh, in response to emergency, it always brings out the authentic. So I'm not sure that it's anything but authentic right now. But I do think, I think we'll understand them better and we'll be smarter about how we use them. All that said, with the visual arts in particular, well, anything, performing arts, everything, uh, being there matters, you know, yes. being there really matters. In fact, we um, just sort of, you know, just off of a like, a, a, a very automatic response, like what are we gonna call our programming at the modern and uh, being there was, what we came up with just immediately because um, we don't want to forget that. We don't want to forget the value of um, being in that space, being in front of the work, um, 
feeling, again, like I said, uh, measuring our bodies against uh, the height and weight and scale of, of art. Um, all of that is very much a part of the experience. Um, and I, I do think that Walt Whitman would be happy with the way that our bodies and minds have had to unite uh, yes. through this process in a way that we might not have uh, made time or allowance for if we hadn't been forced. It's very true. It's been, uh, it, it's been really neat to see other aspects of, uh, of myself, and I know that uh, other people have validated this, just an uh, 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 opening of how we process things. We get so tied into ritual habits, um, process, and it has uh, uh, been a real epiphany to see uh, experiences change in ourselves, in our uh, thinking, in our practices. And I, I certainly hope it carries over. And I think we really have an opportunity as a, uh, as a society to slow down, listen more, and really get back to uh, uh, communication. I know that the world is uh, very divided right now. And so I just, I really hope and pray that we continue to use these opportunities to hear one another and, uh, and continue to learn how to uh, uh, communicate uh, with one another as well, because it's, it's really the only way we're gonna get through this. And um, I hope we take these tools with us and really see this as a, uh, an opportunity for us to uh, not only align, but just listen and, um, and be appreciative of one another because uh, it's really all we've got at this point. So crazy times. So um, on a little bit of a lighter note, uh, once you get back out and around, um, what food venue or uh, uh, activity are you most looking to uh, indulge in once this all uh, calms down a little bit and you feel safe enough to get out and around? Well, I'm very much uh, looking forward to art openings. Um, it's something that artists, visual artists do as a show of support, but I think they, we will all be doing it um, selfishly because we need that, that human interaction and conversation that happens in the space itself again. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to um, having gatherings here in this space that we, as we've done in the past, where people can actually come in close. They don't have to bring their own chair and their own <laughs> beverages with them. They can actually, you know, we can we can throw a party. Um, I'm looking forward to being in the galleries um, with other people, exchanging ideas and not being concerned about anything except for that exchange. Um, I'm looking forward to going and sitting um, on the patio of Righteous Foods or um, going to Tokyo Cafe or um, those are all the places that are close to me or um, Ampersand and getting a coffee or going to Salsa Limon over here. And these are just, and I've, I've tried to be supportive of course by um, doing takeout from those places. But I think we realized pretty quickly that um, environment matters like it matters that you have even people you don't know sitting at the table next to you that it adds to the experience of um yeah socializing just straight up socializing i hear you um community is everything and uh you've got to be engaged with it to actually um uh feel the uh importance of it and uh you know, we gotta, gotta keep plugging forward and uh, I'm very grateful to opportunities like this to be able to engage uh, with the community. And while it may not be as uh, uh, fulfilling as um, sitting across from someone and uh, uh, feeling their energy as well in a conversation, it has uh, certainly been something that I have uh, benefited from uh, meeting uh, artists and people in the area and in the industry. And I'm just very grateful, I, I don't know, uh, what I would have done without some of those opportunities. And I know that there are uh, certain people that may not have those uh, outlets to be able to express themselves. And um, on that note, do you have any tips or tricks for uh, staying sane mentally and physically during all of this? Well, it sounds so trite, but um, I'm 61 
and I want to, at 71, be able to do the things that I do now, and at 71, I want to be able to do that at 81. So um, I have, um, for some time now, had the practice of getting up and doing yoga in the morning, and I used to do it um, sort of as a discipline, and now I do it as an absolute need. <laughs> My body gets going because I, I stretch it, and I remind myself of alignment and breath and all of that. And with that, um, I have a meditation practice that matters. But I think everybody has to find their own way in that regard. Um, yes. you know, different people need different things. That's, that's what I need, and um, I feel very fortunate to have found that. There's a lot about myself I'm still learning, but I do know that I need, I need that. And it has helped immensely getting through this. Family helps immensely. Um, again, I feel so so fortunate and to have that and um, my heart goes out to anyone who's feeling lonely uh, in this moment um, and um, I hope they find solace in, in, in their various ways and I know they I know people have tools we all do that's we're survivors that's what we do um, reading is really important to me um, so I have a nice library that I think if I was um, quarantined uh, until my last days, I, I wouldn't get through all my books. So um, I, I'm also a slow reader, not to magnify the size of my library. But <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, those are some things. Um, family, friends. We have a great neighbors um, that are like our family, and that we're we're really fortunate. I I um, I battle not actually feeling kind of guilty about that like we, we have some things and um, you know I guess I'll just say I I recognize my privilege and um, I'm looking forward to finding ways to um, to use that privilege for a larger good uh, as well I couldn't agree like more I, said, I think we're all trying to find ways to pull together unite and uh, and help any way we can. Yeah. And I certainly hope that that continues. So, okay, I'm going to start plating up. I think you're a little bit ahead of me. I didn't seem to burn anything down. So I'll move forward with that. And while I do, I was wondering if you would uh, mention or talk a little bit about any helpful community resources that you are seeing or using personally or at the museum. And how can your organization be assisted or provide assistance to other artists and organizations? Wow, that's an enormous uh, set of questions there. And um, I'm not going to, um, I'm gonna fail you on this because it's not gonna all come to me. I'll be thinking about later what I wish I had said. You but, can always um, come back onto the feed and put anything in you want. Looks like we are back on. And uh, thank you everybody for staying with us in our technical difficulties there. Um, we are back and wrapping up our interview here with Terry Thornton. Terry, I was just asking you about uh, community resources, if you'd like to uh, kind of touch on that a little bit and things you've been seeing or using. Um, you know, of course, the, it's like the, um, again, we're very fortunate to live where we, we, where we do and to have access to what we have access to. Um, I'm going to draw a blank, I know, on all of the amazing things. Um, I'm impressed with, and you know, I don't want this to sound self-serving, but I'm really impressed with, and because I also, I have such close contact with, um, the way the various museums have responded to this, and really throughout the arts, you know. Um, so locally, I think, you know, get online and check out what, what each of the, um, the museums, uh, the museums of all kind, actually, and because I think, um, I don't know, I, I just think that everybody realized kind of how important uh, what we do is, you know, and um, with that, um, they, they created some really beautiful opportunities. Um, I'm going to be honest, I have been clinging so closely to family and place. Um, that I have not reached out that much. So outside of kind of what I've come across through my work experience, um, 
again, I just know I'm failing enormously because there are things that um, I should be uh, using this opportunity to plug. Well, I, right now I'm gonna plug this um, exhibition that's up at Blind Alley because I've moved over using my phone and I'm right in front of Hector Ramirez's um, exhibition. Um, and I'm going to go down and even show you, I, I'm totally diverting what you've asked for. Can you see the, the text on the glass there? I certainly can, yes. Okay, so there's your information. This is the exhibition and it's, and the reflection of the glass has become such a part of any exhibition that's here. Um, I'm gonna step back a little bit so that you can see the three white columns. Yes. Uh, and the grate that we're all kind of familiar with, they're often over windows for protection. And then this little element of humor in this otherwise very pristine and gorgeous, uh, elegant, visually elegant um, installation. You have this funny element of the kid's um, rubber ball that's gotten caught in, in the grave. <laughs> ah, very nice. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, how's that for? Uh, not answering your question. <laughs> I think that's but, great. Uh, I, yeah, I wish so badly I could have had notes for that one because um, there's so much good out there. It deserves to have, um, oh, I can't go over there because my, uh, my computer has decided to work now. So I'm, we're going to get some serious feedback if I walk that direction. <laughs> You're quite all right. We had uh, well, a sandwich early. And uh, I think the presentation of that gallery is going to top my mac and cheese. So. Um, I just oh, no way. Terry, if you've got any links or anything that you'd like to uh, post for us, just come back to the Fort Worth Community Arts Center's uh, Facebook page, and then you can put it right there under our interview as well. So I'm all about it. All right. I will do that. You ready to see my Thank masterwork? Let's see it. All right. Oh my gosh, it looks amazing. There you go. Oh. I Sriracha on there. Wow. And I also added a little bit of red pepper flakes, and I am happy to say, I think that that might be actually better than a box. So uh, I you know I think there's a really good chance of that. You couldn't go worse, but can be. But you worked hard for that. It should be better. I did, and I'm going to work hard enjoying it. So Terry, good job. Any thoughts, or um, would you like to pitch anything about where we can find any any information on you? Um, your Blind Alley project? Um, the Blind Alley, as I said, www.blindalleyprojects.com. Um, we also have an Instagram page, uh, Blind Alley Projects. Um, yeah, and uh, as far as me, um, I don't have anything coming up soon. I don't know, Google, Google the name. <laughs> see, see if you find anything. All right, Terry, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Um, do you feel safe working your way back to that sandwich while I wrap us up? Uh, yeah, I think we might get some feedback um, because, like I said, my uh, computer's on. So I might need to, I don't know, we'll see. You're okay. We'll see what happens and I'll start wrapping us up. And if we can just get one more okay. look at it, we're good. So that wraps it up for this episode of Box Lunch, folks. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We'll be back on Monday, June 8th with Manya Shore, who is the director of the Fort Worth Public Library. So make sure you check out Blind Alley and drive by over there on 4th Street in Fort Worth. Check out that fabulous drive-by gallery. Again, Terry, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful lunch. And with that being said, bon appetit, my friend. It was a pleasure to meet you and visit with you. Thank you for joining me for lunch. Bon appetit. Lovely. All right. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everybody. Fort Worth Community Arts Center. Have a great day. A wonderful weekend. Please be kind to one another. Please listen and please take care of each other. We love you. We'll see you guys back on Monday. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>